No, no, no. It's gonna be the Panzer guy. You know, the Panzer guy. Yeah. No, not Guderian. <sighs> yeah, all right. Okay. January 25th, 1941. Operation Compass, the British counteroffensive versus the Italians in Libya, has been going on for six weeks now and has been a major success. But Libya is not the only Italian possession in Africa. This week, far to the southeast, the British also strike. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Luftwaffe began heavily bombing Malta. French and Thai forces clashed in Cambodia, the British made preparations for actions in Africa, and the Chinese communists gained some valuable international PR after being defeated by the nationalists two weeks ago. Here's what follows. There is some fighting this week between the Chinese and the invading Japanese forces. In southern Henan province, the Japanese are trying to make Wuhan safe from Chinese forces that threaten it. On the 25th, at the end of the week, three Japanese divisions break the first Chinese defensive line heading towards Wuyang. There is also action in Southeast Asia in the Franco-Thai War. On the 24th, Thai bombers raid the French airfield at Angor. It seems, however, that hostilities in this war are winding down, and after last week's French attacks by both land and sea, Japan is proposing that the belligerents sign an armistice, concerned that the war is starting to go in France's favor. Nothing has been signed yet. Well, that fighting may be winding down, but the war in Africa is heating up. William Platt's offensive against Eritrea begins the 19th, and that day, Kassala and Tessenai, which had been evacuated by the Italians, are taken. Then the 5th Indian Division moves along the south towards Aikota and then hopefully Bishia. The 4th takes the northern route towards Keru. The roads are mined and the bridge over the river Gash blown, but they make good time anyhow and by the 21st have occupied Aikota. But the 4th reaches Keru Gorge, defended by five Italian battalions and are pinned down, unable to do much of anything. However, the 5th brilliantly, detaches a motor machine gun group and a light infantry group from Ekota and sends them with all haste to the roads behind the Keru position. They bayonet their way through the pass and cross the Italian rear the 22nd, taking prisoner a force that could, and maybe should, have held the pass for weeks, a full six of Italian commander Luigi Frucci's men. By the 25th, they have occupied Siagle Wells and are within 10 kilometers of Agordat, that and Barentu are Frushi's final resistance points, but by the end of the week, the British have cut communications between them. And as for the African action to the Northwest, well, last week I went over the battle plan that the British and Australian forces have for attacking Tobruk. That battle begins this week at 5.40 a.m. January 21st and goes pretty much according to plan. Check out last week's episode if you want details. By mid-afternoon, not just Tobruk, but 25,000 prisoners, 208 big guns, and 87 tanks have been captured at a cost of 400 men. The major goal of the attack is to capture the harbor undamaged, and while it isn't entirely undamaged, it is still very much functional. They also take 10,000 tons of water, refrigeration and distillation works, and a power station. Within 48 hours, the harbor has been swept from mines and is now usable as the main African supply base west of Alexandria. Richard O'Connor's forces aren't just sitting around, though. Already by the end of the 22nd, the 4th Armored Brigade has made steam from Tobruk and cut the roads west, south, and southeast from Mechili. And the 7th Armored Brigade is around 35 kilometers from Derna. What the next big goal of this wildly successful North African offensive is, though, is Benghazi. Thing is, back on the 11th, the British government decided that Greece was going to soon be top priority for all men, supplies, planes, or whatever would be necessary to help the Greeks face what they think is an impending German invasion of Greece. Archie Wavell, commander-in-chief of the whole Middle Eastern sector, which includes North Africa, has been told that after the fall of Tobruk, that priority change takes place. He strongly objected to the subsequent proposals to denude the forces in Libya, particularly since the buildup of the Luftwaffe in Sicily boded ill for the future. But they were overridden by the prime minister and the chiefs of staff, who nevertheless insisted that Benghazi should be taken and developed as a base for both the Navy and the Air Force. 
So they're going to take away a lot of his strength and his supplies, but he still has to take Benghazi. And to do that, he's leaving the desert for different terrain. I'll talk about the region in some detail next week. But for now, the Australians focus on Derna, and the 7th Armored Division attacks the Italian armor at Mechili. As the week comes to its end, the Italian defenses at Derna are holding off the Australians, and Electric Whiskers, Annabale Bergonzoli, manages to avoid his 20th Corps being surrounded at Mechili the 23rd. And with Italian bomber and fighter support, his forces are holding off the enemy at Derna Airfield. As a side note to this campaign, on the 19th, Benito Mussolini invites at Ober Salzburg as Adolf Hitler's guest. Hitler, as he has already told his commanders, tells Mussolini he will send a force to Tripoli. It is to be commanded by Erwin Rommel. Hitler also figures tangentially in some developments this week in Romania. On the 21st in Bucharest, the Iron Guard spends the day hunting down Jews. They beat thousands of them and 120 are killed. Many of those hung on hooks in a slaughterhouse with signs on them saying, kosher meat. This is the Bucharest pogrom, and it happens the same time as the Legionnaires Rebellion. Okay, there had been anti-Jewish legislation in Romania, which had grown more and more restrictive since the Jewish Codex last August, which you can look up. We've also seen over the past couple of months tensions seriously growing between Conducator, leader, Ion Antonescu on one side, and Horia Sima and the Iron Guard on the other. This continues to grow. But the thing is, both sides believe in the seizure of Jewish property and assets. But Antonescu, as head of state, wants it done to benefit the government and Romania as a whole. While the legionnaires of the Iron Guard, they were originally called the Legion of the Archangel Michael, hence legionnaires, are basically robbing Jews for their own benefit. Antonescu sees this as detrimental for Romania. So it's more about method. Antonescu wants it to be by legal appropriation rather than by robbery, terror, murder, which is what has been happening to a lot of Jews, even as others have been forced to sell their assets for basically nothing legally. Well, this has been boiling all through January, with Antonescu demanding that the Iron Guard cease its escalating terror tactics. In return, they have linked him to both the Freemasons and his family relation to Jews, his ex-wife and her mother. Were Jews, and begun plotting to oust him and take over the country. They've been calling for a solution to the Jewish problem and trying to enlist sympathy from Nazi Germany. Well, they do have plenty of sympathizers within the Nazi organization, but guess what? The Iron Guard does not run the Romanian government. Antonescu, who does and who, you know, controls the Romanian army, met with Hitler last week on the 14th and promised Romanian support in any future war with the USSR and in return got Hitler's silent support for eliminating his enemies within the Iron Guard. On the 19th, Antonescu fires the Minister of the Interior, the head of the security police and the Bucharest police. Loyal military men are appointed to their posts and the army secures the telephones, police stations and hospitals. Legionnaires, however, prevent those men from taking their new posts and the Legionnaires' rebellion begins the 20th. They are well armed. They capture a bunch of government buildings. For two days, the military defends itself from attacks but does not itself crack down. During that time, the pogrom happens. The legionnaires, however, do not stop with just Jews but kill a bunch of soldiers from the army. Okay, this is gonna be long story short, but I need to point out that the rebellion and the pogrom were parallel events, both intentionally organized, with one not being a side effect of the other. Well, Antonescu is busy bringing in tanks to Bucharest, and his army is ready to explode over the anti-army violence by legionnaires. And at the height of their fury, he gives the order to shut down the rebellion, which they do in hours. A few dozen soldiers are killed, and at least a couple hundred legionnaires, but the aftermath is big. Nearly 10,000 legionnaires are sentenced to prison. Hori Asima flees the country to Germany. German troops march through the streets of Bucharest and cheer Antonescu. The power of the Iron Guard is broken for good, and Antonescu's hold on the nation is that much stronger. And here are a couple of notes about other individuals to end the week. On the 24th, Franz von Fera, a German fighter pilot who'd been taken prisoner after crashing in England last June, turns up in New York, 
See, a couple weeks ago, he'd been sent with hundreds of other German POWs to a POW camp in Canada. Eight of the men had managed to escape on the train across Canada, but von Vera is the only one who is not recaptured. While he's in New York, Hitler awards him the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. And of course, Canada tries to have him extradited. But this takes time. And during that time, he will go through Mexico, Panama, Brazil, and Spain, and make his way back to Germany. Also that day, the 24th, Frank Knox, American Secretary of the Navy, writes to Secretary of War Henry Stimson, if war eventuates with Japan, it is believed easily possible that hostilities would be initiated by a surprise attack upon the fleet or the naval base at Pearl Harbor with inherent possibilities of a major disaster. And with that possible foreboding, the week ends with British successes in both East and North Africa, fighting in China, but a slowing of hostilities in Cambodia. Also this week, the British carrier Illustrious, damaged as we saw recently, leaves Malta for Alexandria for repairs. And of course, there is the rebellion and pogrom in Romania. Now, you may not think it has much to do with the war, but it does. Everything does by now. Romania has promised military aid if Germany attacks the USSR, which Hitler is determined to do. Germany is going to send troops through Romania to attack Greece, which Hitler is determined to do. Romanian oil is a big power source for the German army. So no matter what it says in the papers, Romania is already a part of this war. So is everybody else. Unfortunately, war crimes and pogroms behind the front lines are nothing new in this Second World War. And we've actually done a War Against Humanity special on Nazi terror and crimes early in the war. You can check that out right here, coming any minute now. And remember what I said, everybody is a part of this war, which means we need every one of you to help us fund this war effort because it is you that makes this channel happen. One awesome person who helps us do this is our patron of the week, Jeffrey Zahn. Do like Jeffrey and make sure to support us at patreon.com or timegoes.tv. I cannot emphasize this enough. Every dollar does count. So don't forget to subscribe, <laughs> ring that bell. See you next time.